I'll begin the recording. So hello everyone. Uh, welcome to our seminar series in environmental psychology at the HSC. Uh, today we're delighted to have uh, Cameron Brick with us. Uh, Cameron is uh, assistant professor at the University of Amsterdam and he is going, he's a very well known figure in environmental psychology and we are really excited to have him today. Um, he has also developed um, a very up-to-date scale of um, pro-environmental behavior, which we have translated and adapted in Russian and which we are using. Um, and we are very happy that um, we can listen to his talk today on individual and contextual influences on pro-environmental behavior. Very excited about it. So. That's great. Thank you for that very kind introduction. Yeah. And you may be able to tell from my accent, I grew up in the United States, but I have lived in five countries now, so I have no idea where I'm from, but uh, currently in planning to stay in the Netherlands. I have sent in the chat the link to these slides. If you prefer to uh, browse them yourself, feel free. They are open access. Thank you. And uh, all right, let's get started. So the, our title is Individual and Contextual Influences on Pro-Environmental Behavior. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about whether pro-environmental behavior is even one coherent concept within psychology. Yeah, so I study social influence around large scale social problems. And there's a, for me, there's a key paradox in human behavior. People know what actions promote good outcomes for themselves, their, their finances, the environment, but they often behave in harmful ways. And so consider these kinds of puzzling uh, examples in the environment. Farmers avoid organic or more bio-friendly bio techniques that they know are more profitable. So why are they avoiding them? Or uh, people on the political left will pay more for electric cars that look like electric cars compared to ones that look like normal cars. Why would that be? And I think these behaviors cannot be explained in pure economic terms alone. So that's why uh, there's a contribution here for psychology. Some of the most exciting work about why, uh, you know, applying psychology to real world conservation behavior is done by this company, Opower, which, uh, which sends messages to consumers at the end of every month, like you get an electric bill or a water bill but they also compare you to similar sized uh, neighbors, neighbors with similar houses, and they tell you how much energy you're using compared to them. And so, for example, this report says that uh, you're doing better than the average, but not as good as the most efficient ones. And they give you a little rating here on the right, uh, you know, you're doing good. And so this combines both descriptive social norms and injunctive social norms. And I'm just presenting it as an example of the way that uh, these insights have been translated to real world um, savings. So Opower is operating in, I don't know, 60 countries or something. They report that they have saved 20 terawatt hours and that's enough to power all of Russia for a week. So this, is a, this is a significant amount of savings from small scale messaging changes. And of course, there are different kinds of interventions we could give as well. Um, broadly speaking, environmental psychology seems to be a, in a growth period and in a growth area right now. And I'm noticing that not just because um, the social psychological journals are being open to these um, kinds of investigations, but also that uh, I'm getting an increasing amount of work into other more domain general journals and also um, magazines that are for the public interest that aren't sort of specifically uh, just for scientists. So there's, there's broad interest, I would say, which is nice. This picture was drawn for us for an article in the, uh, in the British Psychological Society. Uh, what did we call? Yawning Towards the Apocalypse, I think was the title of that one. And so they drew this, uh, I, I love this image, very nice. Okay, and, uh, and I also have been giving groups, uh, sorry, giving talks to groups lately that are in more cognitive neuroscience and other areas within psychology. And they sometimes ask, well, I'm not in social, social psych, so what should I be contributing here? And actually there's, there's an increasing amount of interest to climate change and other environmental concerns. 
across psychology. So here are some of the examples of recent titles. Um, in particular, uh, this paper in Nature, Ecology and Evolution was interesting because it suggested that there, that some scientists have been hesitant to get involved with, um, with topical political and environmental issues because they don't want to uh, risk their perceived credibility. But they have done some studies and suggested that actually scientists can maintain their credibility while taking political positions um, as well. So uh, this is just an encouragement to be a citizen as well as a scientist. We can do our work in multiple domains. So how is it that one could even personally get involved um, separate from the doing of the psychological research? And these were some suggestions from my collaborator in uh, San Diego, Adam Aaron and, and colleagues. And, uh, and I've just highlighted flying less and uh, um, that's a certainly a accessible and high impact one uh, that we even mentioned earlier in our conversation today. So that's the, that's the big background. And what I have been doing lately is trying to predict and influence pro-environmental behaviors of different kinds. And I've been sort of filling out this diagram, trying to look at both contextual uh, influences. So like at the top there, social visibility, and also individual differences like personality and attitudes, values, worldviews, uh, beliefs, and all that. And uh, so this is a very simplified diagram, but just to say that this is how I'm thinking about my own work. Like how do we predict pro-environmental behavior and what kinds of factors should we, we be investigating in each individual study? Of course, one study can't do it all. Um, I, I will turn now to talking about social visibility in particular, because this is a, a real focus of mine. I think we have four papers on this now and, uh, and was also the focus of my dissertation. So imagine this person is in a park and they're drinking a plastic water bottle. And let's say, you know, in this image, the two bins are very close, but let's say they were farther away, or maybe the trash is right next to him and the recycling is farther away and would take some effort. And so the question is, you know, what do you do with the bottle? And I have been asking, does it matter whether other people are watching? The basic social psychological background to this is that there's a few reasons why it might matter. Um, we know that people are motivated to feel good about themselves and the groups they belong to. And uh, that's basic observations from social identity theory and others. And we know that all kinds of behaviors signal those identities and reputations to others. And these are the reasons why we behave in all kinds of ways. This is why I'm wearing a, a collared shirt to a talk I give publicly, or this is why we sit down when we're in a classroom. It could be a really wide range of behaviors, but the suggestion here is that pro-environmental behaviors, conservation behaviors also have social meaning. And so we can look, we can use them as a lens to ask these fundamental social psychological questions about social influence, about identity and about signaling. And if we think about identity in particular, <clears throat> We can imagine that on the far end of the environmentalist uh, scale, we, you know, we conjure up an image of activists, of, uh, of people who are radically changing their lifestyle. And on the other end of the scale, uh, I have just put someone who looks a bit boring or drab. And, and I did that on purpose because you could have activists on the other end of the scale as well. You could have anti-environmentalists, but I think more often, you just have non-environmentalists, people that are just not that engaged with it. They have other values that are more important to them, whether it's country or family or their, their job or whatever it is. And they're just not that bothered about this particular issue. So where people align on the spectrum can also be um, hooked into this uh, story about signaling. Uh, you may be familiar with this famous paper, Green to be Seen, from 2010. Um, it has a thousand something citations. It doesn't need to be cited anymore. You can cite more recent work, but it was very influential in suggesting that people do green behaviors uh, also for social reasons. 
And this, it was hypothetical. Uh, they didn't make real decisions and it was in uh, university students only. And they used these social priming techniques about visibility. That is, they weren't actually being observed. So a limited beginning study, but an important one. And they called that effect green to be seen, do green behaviors, and you can be observed by other people. And maybe the implicit argument is you'll get social benefits. And that can happen through identity signaling kinds of things, but it could also happen through identity consistency effects, which is to suggest that we might do green things um, because we want to see ourselves as green people, that we are doing something aligned with our own uh, expectation of ourselves. So what I noticed uh, a little bit after reading that was another, another paper by Dina Gromay um, and I was very impressed by this. And it, she basically found that if you offer people an opportunity to buy an efficient light bulb, uh, like she gave them some money in the lab and then they could buy it or not actually buy it. Uh, she found that it mattered whether the light bulb came with a sticker that said protect the environment. That is conservatives uh, in the US political uh, leftists and right uh, didn't have a strong um, difference in whether they purchased the energy efficient light bulb until it came with the sticker that said protect the environment. And then suddenly the people on the right were rejecting the opportunity to buy it. And, and so that, that effect, which uh, was quite influential at the time too, what I realized is that th this might be the same effect. That is to say this, which we could call, I don't know, brown to keep down. What if this is the same set of identity related processes that's driving both increases in pro-environmental behavior and decreases as a function of identity. So the link here and the way to move forwards was to realize, okay, what's the identity? Can we measure that and demonstrate that uh, both effects in a single study? And uh, as part of my dissertation, we collected a bunch of data, which turned out to be multi-level. And I didn't realize that when I was uh, gathering it actually, but then Anyway, we asked a bunch of people about a bunch of behaviors, and then we tried different kinds of analyses, and this is what we came up with. We were predicting how much they did the behaviors in their own life. This is self-report previous behavior uh, using that scale that Elena mentioned earlier. As a function of how much they identified with the group environmentalists. And so the first thing that you see is that everything is sloping up to the right, which is as expected, people who see themselves as more environmentalist are reporting more behaviors. But the key finding here is that behaviors that are more visible to other people have a steeper slope. That is to say, when the behaviors can be seen by others, identity has a bigger effect. And that is uh, as we would predict from the account I gave you on the last slide. Now this is demonstrating the contrast of the brown to keep down effect. It doesn't show the green to be seen effect on the right. And I showed uh, that in other uh, studies. There were three studies in this paper, um, but I didn't ever show both of them at the same time. And we could talk about why. I think it has to do with statistical power. As another real world example of this, I, I was um, some an audience member actually let me know that um, so there was some related work and now I folded it into this talk because I think it's great. So the World Wildlife Fund has been engaged with trying to reduce rhino horn purchase in Vietnam and other countries. And in particular, their target, the group that is using rhino horn uh, for sort of social and reputational benefits is wealthy urban men of middle age. And so how do you message this group about this environmental concern? Should you say, okay, you're hurting the, the cute rhinos and we should take care of them? Or how do they go about this? And they made a pretty unusual decision and that was to spend a lot of money, but not to mention the, themselves, not to mention wildlife or, uh, or eco-friendliness in their advertisements. Instead, they went with an ad campaign that uh, they focused around success and good fortune and they featured smiling, powerful businessmen. And they basically say, you don't need rhino horn. Uh, you know, those things are already there. They, you already have them, kind of like success and, and good fortune. And apparently this campaign was successful. And I think that's a nice example of recognizing that the target audience probably is not um, 
likely to feel moved by certain kinds of pro-environmental messaging and that they could even move away from it as a function of that messaging and to avoid those backfire kind of effects. So the key from this section of the talk, I would say is that individuals may signal social identities with pro-environmental behavior. And that means that how you communicate and offer opportunities for conservation and other pro-environmental behaviors should be done very carefully. And if we look at these kind of popular labels, like the EU organic label is a leaf, you know, if you just asked people, you just show them the leaf and say, what kind of person is associated with this? If they say, oh, it's a young urban woman who's politically left, I'm just making those things up, but let's say that they have those associations and let's say they don't belong to those groups. They might avoid that product even though they could have perfectly consistent attitudes towards the environment, desire for conservation, knowledge about climate change, all of the kinds of other factors that we have often studied. Yes, so the scale that I have been uh, using, the, the uh, REBS or recurring pro-environmental behavior scale uses a, a, a broad basket of different behaviors and some of them are more direct like transportation, some of them are more indirect like education, um, but trying to capture a really broad scale of uh, the ways people interact with their own environmental impact. But I, I should mention right up front that I, uh, this is quite different than measuring their impact like the carbon footprint. And so at the beginning of any study, one should really ask carefully whether what you wanna do is investigate their self-report of what kinds of behaviors they're doing, or are you more interested in their actual environmental impact? Because those, those will lead you down different measurement paths. But this, is a, this has been useful for one half of that. And I wanna describe one more study that we did with this that came out a couple of years ago. So I told you about the explicit identification, which by which I mean, you ask them, you know, which group do you feel like, okay, agree, disagree, yes, that's me, no, that's not me. But you could also imagine that there's um, identification with these groups that's more implicit, by which I mean, it has some components of being uncontrolled or unaware or automatic uh, in their thinking. Implicit associations have been shown to impact behaviors, for example, related to self-esteem and racial attitudes. So what if people are either unable or unwilling to report accurately about their identification? Well, maybe we should look at both at once. And I have bent this line slightly to just suggest to you that I was assuming that they would be correlated. That is high implicit and high explicit would be correlated, but maybe orthogonal. So we used a couple thousand observations and four online studies done in collaboration with Project Implicit out of Harvard. And this was uh, run by Calvin Lai, who is at um, Washington St. Louis. And uh, this was also my first project that I posted open code and data and materials at the open science framework. And, uh, and we pre-registered these. And so that was an in a real introduction to me there's no better teacher than just doing, and we did it because he was more experienced with those and I learned from him. So I've hidden the bottom um, results. I'll just introduce the top and then you can see in context. And what you see across these studies is that the explicit uh, environmentalist identity is strongly correlated with their self-reported pro-environmental behavior across all the studies. And the big diamond is just an average between those four studies that we collected. So the real question is, uh, you know, it, not only a zero order correlation, uh, actually, let me, let me back up on that for just a second. So in terms of just uh, like direct correlation, no additional variables, both explicit and implicit both correlate positively with pro-environmental behavior, implicit much more weakly. What I'm showing you now is the partial correlation. So this is explicit when you have already accounted for implicit. This is the unique role of explicit. And this is the unique role of implicit. Almost zero, averages, uh, <clears throat> averages to something overlapping zero. 
And you might ask yourself, well, why did you run four studies on this? Well, imagine what I was thinking after we ran the first study. We had a significant uh, effect there, a unique one for implicit. We ran it again and, you know, improving our materials and it got slightly weaker. And then we ran it two more times and then we decided, okay, if there is an effect here, it's small and it's not very important. And also the implicit is a lot harder to measure than the explicit. So the takeaway of this is, no, you can just ask them four questions. Do you like being an environmentalist? You know, that sort of question. And uh, that's good enough. But it was uh, an interesting project. Okay. So we have been talking about self-reported pro-environmental behaviors, but I also have been interested in recent years in, um, in more objective or uh, observed pro-environmental behaviors because people, I mentioned earlier that people might be unwilling or unable to report their own um, identity. That doesn't seem to be a problem, but I do think that there's even more of a claim that they might be unwilling or unable to report certain aspects of their own behavior. So if you look at the REBS, uh, the scale that I presented earlier, it has, uh, it has scale labels that go from never to always. And it, that's a long way away from measuring actual impact. And that was done on purpose to help people think, you know, do I do this? Okay, yeah, sometimes. And that makes good psychological sense and that's easy for the participant to operate. Um, but you can imagine that there's certain ways we could have asked those questions that would be very difficult for the participant to operate that are more accurate in a way. Like we could have asked them, how many minutes did you shower last month? And that's gonna be very hard for people to answer, but it would be much closer to the actual impact of how much water they're using than for them to say, I sometimes took shorter showers because of environmental reasons or something like that. So I'm just presenting that there's a tension here in how we're measuring this and how we're thinking about it. And one other option is to use pro-environmental behaviors that you can actually observe. So uh, for this section, I give all credit to Florian Lange, who is at uh, KU Leuven in Belgium. He's a collaborator of mine, and he developed this objective repeated pro-environmental measure that can be used in the laboratory with not too much equipment actually. And so this, Oh, it says accepted. Yeah, th this paper is uh, complete and also published there now. This was a registered report, which means that we specified everything up front and then ran the study. But I'll tell you more about that in a minute. So here's the paradigm that he suggested, and it's about transportation, but actually it doesn't have to be about transportation. It could be anything. It's just that the participants make a repeated set of decisions or they get to choose between car, bike, and when they choose car, the actual experiment that they're in goes faster. That is to say, they can leave the lab sooner. And everyone likes their own time, so you could incentivize them with money or time. In this case, it's time. But they're told that if you choose the fast way, it will emit some pollution. And actually, it does, uh, which I'll show you. So let's say they choose the bike in this case, they're gonna make a bunch of these decisions. So let's say they choose the bike, then they see this screen that says, no lights were turned on, no CO2 is being produced, and they have to wait 30 seconds or however long it is. Let's say in another moment they choose the car, then they see the screen, 12 lights have been turned on because of your choice, and that uses this much carbon dioxide. And in the room, the lights actually turn on. So that's the, that's the real difference here is that there is a real environmental behavior. Now, maybe they don't care that much. That's always possible, but there is an actual pollution happening and they are responsible for it. So you would, you can use this as a improved measure of how willing they are to do environmental damage. Um, and I, I think this is actually quite clever because um, it gets around a lot of these self-report issues. So we, uh, this also has been accepted since. What we did is we set up a, a test of the visibility hypothesis that I presented earlier. That was only correlational data. This is experimental data. We had people where you can see in this image, they're separated by a, a, a barrier. They're doing the task and they can't be watched versus there's no barrier and they can be watched. So we had people that were uh, doing the task next to each other or not. And we had observers and they can see the target who's doing the actual choices. 
And the target knows that the observer knows what the lights mean. So we made sure to try and make this as, as make the signaling potentially mean something. And the manipulation checks were successful. So it suggested that uh, that went as expected. Okay, our main test here is powered 90% for an effect size of D equals 0.5. That's quite a large effect. So if there was a smaller one, we didn't have good power to detect it because the study was a bit expensive. Our participants uh, were from KU Leuven and uh, here's some demographics, but broadly speaking, they were mostly students and, uh, and a little bit more female than male. And uh, some preliminary results, uh, people chose the uh, bike less often when the waiting time was high, that makes sense. You know, they're sensitive to waiting time and they're sensitive to how many lights are being lit because that varied and you can get a sort of more granular sense of how much damage they're willing to do. And people who said that they were more environmentalists did choose the bike more often, uh, which is good, that's as expected although that didn't moderate the observability effect. Now that test, the moderation, very underpowered. So take that for what it is. But the main difference between the public and the private conditions, to our surprise, no difference. So being observed in this study didn't lead people to change the amount that they chose bike versus car. But because this was a registered report, what happened was we pre-registered all the approach and the methods and the tests and everything, we wrote the introduction, the journal accepted it. And they said, basically, that's what the, I'm telling you, this is what a registered report means. They say, yes, we accept your paper for publication. Now run it and report whatever the results are. And I really, really like this format because it takes all the pressure out of whether you get significant results or like whether you need to really torture your data in all different ways or whatever. We promised we would test this we did, and here's the result, and it's out in that journal, and it's a good journal. So if you have enough time, uh, I think register reports can be a nice way to run research projects. Okay, there was, we also did a donation um, thing, and there was no difference in observability on donation. Now, what does this mean for the, you know, the 10 minutes I talked about visibility earlier? I'd say that there's still wide evidence across economics and psychology for environmental behaviors being used in social signaling. And a lot of that evidence is self-report, but not all of it. So for example, um, what was it? Um, gosh, I can't remember the author right now, but someone has been working on solar panel um, installation in neighborhoods. And if your neighbors have a solar panel on their house, it makes you more likely to have one there's kind of a social contagion effect. And that has been, um, been done with aerial photos. So no self-report at all. Um, so I, I think, I, think the, I would still say, I think this effect is real, even though we didn't observe it. But here are some differences between the two studies that I presented today. They're, they're really quite different. So maybe it's that uh, this effect is still plausible. Um, but we need to answer some other questions like, okay, not all pro-environmental behaviors are the same. Or when we say visibility, visibility to whom? Like maybe to your friends or family or coworkers matters, but to some random student that we brought into the experiment doesn't matter. And we haven't tested those kinds of moderators. Okay, so that's the end of the visibility part. I have a few more things for you. Okay. So uh, I've been studying sort of social tipping points recently and uh, about environment, you know, people know that littering is uncool now and they mostly avoid it in, uh, in many countries where it used to be much more common. Recycling and there's online discussion about plastic bags and plastic straws. But, uh, the question is, is a tipping point coming on air pollution, on, on rainforest destruction? One of the, um, when I give consulting talks, one of the things I talk about is this, is this graph where it looks, you look at um, new cars being registered in the UK and they're petrol or they're diesel. 
And you can see up to 2016, diesel was really gaining. And if you were to project forward, it would look like, okay, more and more diesel. Let's bet on that. But what actually happened was a huge, huge fall in diesel cars. And so what happened was a tipping point about air quality. You may remember this giant scandal with Volkswagen cheating on their emissions tests. You know, it's hard to predict these things. But the, the end point here is that people do care about the, they care about cheating and they care about uh, environmental impact, um, even if it's uh, only in their neighborhoods, let alone globally. And so you have to try and see these things coming. And is there a tipping point happening on climate change mitigation and adaptation? I think there may be, or it, it's sort of uh, interrupted by the pandemic. But what I saw in London two years ago was uh, a remarkable amount of people being arrested by the police. And I used to live in the UK for three years, by the way. And I'm, I'm saying that's remarkable because normally at these kinds of protests, you might get five arrests or 20, and these are gonna be hardcore activists that have been arrested before. When they arrest you during a protest in London, this kind of peaceful protest, typically you have to want to get arrested. The police will come and they'll say, would you please clear the street? We're gonna let traffic through again. And you, if you sit down and say, no, arrest me, then they're like, fine, we arrest you and they carry you off. So the fact that a thousand people got arrested, a lot of whom would have never been arrested before really meant a, a kind of a shift in the social um, meaning of what environmentalism was. And we did some studies on this. We did, um, for example, an experiment about how people reacted to news coverage about this giant protest in London. And we thought, you know, maybe people are going to react badly because they shut down a lot of traffic. You know, they interrupted economic activity. They made things inconvenient for people's lives to raise awareness about this issue. And so we used three different media coverage uh, uh, stories. We used a, a kind of a center or right wing um, daily um, newspaper called The Mail, which is over here on the right. Commuters face chaos on their journeys home. You can see that's a little bit negative and the rest of the article is negative as well. And then there's a more center one, the BBC here, which just says climate change protests. So you can see they're taking a little bit more balanced neutral view. And then we also expose some participants to a frontline um, extinction rebellion activist himself describing what was happening. And so that we've sort of tried to span the, the gamut here. Does it matter, do their attitudes about the protest matter about which, um, which one of these messages they received? And it, it looks like, yes, you can see the results here on the left. Um, if people were, were re reasonably supportive of XR, that was interesting. And they were much more supportive when they got the report from the activist on the front lines than when they saw the other kinds of messages. So we also saw in this study that political ideology, environmentalism, uh, that those were significant effects. Um, so that's pretty much as expected. We did another study uh, we're writing these up for publication, but of course these things take forever. Um, we did another study on a representative UK sample where we asked people the same sort of questions. Do you support or do you oppose this kind of action? And we did it before, during, and after major protests in London. You can imagine that afterwards there might be more people against because they've read the negative coverage, because they've had trouble getting to work or whatever like that. But what we actually saw was an increase in support. And that was a surprise to me and also an indication that we might be heading towards some sort of tipping point where even inconvenient disruption leads people to support the protests more. Well, you know, if you extrapolate from our representative sample, it looks like two more million people in the UK moved from uh, moved into the strongly support category, which sounds like a lot. So those protests, I would say, quite successful. Um, I mentioned in the abstract that I'm going to share some um, a link to some openly available data, which helps run these studies more affordably. You know, I haven't, I've been a postdoc for a long time and now I'm an assistant professor, but I have almost no research budget. So I've been needing to use openly available data myself and I find it very useful, I recommend it. And I wanna give you an example here 
of a, a former colleague of mine from Santa Barbara who is currently at um, Singapore Management University, uh, Kim and Eon. So he did cultural variability and the link between concern and support for environmental action. The basic idea here is, you know, you have someone's underlying environmental concern and you have how much they're doing pro-environmental behaviors. And we assume that those are moderately related. He asked, are they moderately related the same across different countries? And it turns out not at all the same. Countries are pretty different in this relationship using large scale open data. And I wanna particularly draw your attention to the far right corner where there's some sort of ridiculous little outlier. Oh yes, the United States where almost, you know, I don't know, 60%, 70% of the research in this area is from. So we might have a really misguided view because we haven't been sampling uh, across a wide enough group of populations. Um, and so it's the, in the US, the sort of individual level, um, you know, uh, concern like, oh, I personally care that drives my own political support or my own behavior, maybe more than in other countries, collectivistic countries where it's more about harmony with your group and what are other people doing. So just to point out that all the data I'm showing on the screen right now was free because he just took it from, I think the world values survey. And another study is um, also using openly available data, this time the German household panel study. This is uh, by Busick uh, and um, and looking, he wanted to follow up on some of my work. So he collaborated on this and uh, looked at personality trait effects on uh, solar panel installation. So he was asking, he's an economist by the way, and he was asking, you know, do these personality um, features predict uh, green investment um, separate from risk preferences and environmental concern. And in this study, it looked like uh, risk preferences and environmental concern. Yes, personality traits, not that important. So maybe because Germany had high subsidies and these panels were quite easy to uh, do, like it's not, it didn't take any special person. Maybe that's why we don't know, but um, he showed significant effects in the UK, but not in Germany. Again, though, these no results are no problem for a new crop of journals and focuses. We published this one in Collabora Psychology and they just wanna know, is it, worth, is, is it worth doing and is it well done? They don't ask, do you have significant results? Um, in this case, we didn't have any follow-up. So all of the data collection was free. I mentioned registered reports earlier. Uh, I don't know if any of you have experience with them. I'd be curious to hear in the chat if you do, if you've been a reviewer or if you've ever uh, co-authored on a registered report. I've just, um, I have three now and I just really, really like them um, because methods are the only part of the study that I can control. So I really want to be judged on the quality of the methods, not on the um, specific pattern that falls out or, you know, my persuasiveness about crafting a story that matches the one significant relationship that I was able to observe. Another thing to mention about this is that the peer review process is really positive because instead of the, the reviewer thinking, well, I'm like, I'm a gatekeeper. I'm trying to see if your work is good enough. You haven't done the study yet. So the reviewer can say, hey, you forgot about this feature in the design. Would you add this other control condition? Or have you thought about maybe analyzing it this way instead, like they're on your side. And so you can have this conversation that's a lot more fun than the normal interaction with the reviewers. And you say, oh, thank you very much. Actually, we should do that. Here's our new version where we will totally do that. And uh, I really enjoy that better. And similarly for the analysis, when you get to that critical moment and you press, was there an effect? You don't have to care so much because your publication doesn't depend on it. For me, that makes analysis less emotionally challenging. Oh, nice to hear. Sasha says, uh, did a register report for a master's thesis. I hope you had a good experience too. Um, right, so I have some uh, work in press. Just, these are just the papers that are about environmental issues. And just to highlight, um, there's a debate happening in Journal of Environmental Psychology. This uh, back and forward uh, commentaries that I've been part of about whether we should be paying more, more attention to impact and less attention to say the theory of pro-environmental behavior. 
and uh, you're welcome to dig into that. I, controversy is always exciting. This is the uh, this is the resource with the openly available data sets that I manage, and I will share that in the chat for you as well. So feel free to check that out. And I'd like to end my talk just by mentioning this paper that we got into Nature, uh, which was as big a surprise to me as it might be to you a couple of years ago, um, which was about um, a large, it was 80,000 observations of people who applied to give talks at the American Geophysical Union. So this is mostly physicists and earth scientists. Um, but even, the, you know, of course, well, not of course, but uh, as would be expected, women were a minority of presenters and authors, but even relative to their proportion in the population, they're given fewer speaking um, times than men. And we also analyze this based on um, URM in the lower left here, and that means underrepresented minority groups. This is ethnic and minority groups in the US that would include um, African American and uh, Native American. And we did not include um, Asian in this because in the US, Asian is a, is, a, is a minority ethnic group that is re doing relatively well in science. They're overrepresented in science and they're doing relatively well economically. So in the US, you can think of underrepresented minority as largely being African-American, His, uh, Hispanic, Latino, and, and some other smaller groups. And uh, yes, the, those groups are also underrepresented even relative to their proportion. So they're not getting enough invitations and I encourage all of us to go out of our way to try and identify these authors and invite them. Thank you to my students and collaborators who are responsible for a lot of the hard work of the um, actual studies that I presented today. And, uh, and that's it, I'd be delighted to take your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Cameron. That was really interesting and very rich. Thank you for summarizing, you know, the essence of your research today for us. I think for a lot of us, this was really useful. And I'm sure we have questions. So I'll probably allow, first of all, the audience to ask their questions. and. Sounds great. You can do that out loud or in the chat, either way you like. I think people, yeah, people can speak. Yeah, yeah, please don't raise hands, just crack on with questions. It's fine. Uh, yeah, I guess, can I go first? Mm -hmm. um, thank you for your presentation. It was really interesting to see all this research. One of the questions I had is regarding one of the research papers you made on explicit and implicit environmentalism and its relationship with pro-environmental behavior. What I didn't understand is like, what is implicit, implicit environmentalism? Because hmm. I've never really, I can't imagine that. And how did you measure it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for that. <clears throat> well, it's more well known. People talk more about implicit attitudes. And they talk more about implicit attitudes, especially around questions like race. Like, do you react yeah. more positively or negatively to black or white faces? That sort of thing. But we, we are aware that anything that is a subject of um, cognition could be better reflected, maybe, by processes that are relatively unconscious, uncontrolled, unaware. So if you take something like identifying with a social group, you know, I could say, oh, this, the, here's maybe a better example. So I could say, I really hate the current government in the US. And so if someone asks me, you know, how much do you identify as an American? I might say, no, I, I don't, I don't like that. But if you tested implicitly how I react to American flag, American food, American songs, maybe I, I still show a lot of activation that would suggest I, my self-concept is tied up with Americanness, And so in that sense, you can get a discrepancy between implicit and explicit for any kind of social group identification. And that was our, that was our theory for why we went into that. How we actually measured it was with a single, um, single target implicit association test. And so uh, task, I think. So what they did is they had, um, 
they had words that came up that were related to environmentalism, like conservation and environment and, and those sort of words. And they had to, uh, and they had to label them quickly, uh, me or not me. And then we use the relative speed that they were able to do that with shifting left to right and also with other words. I, I may be misremembering this slightly, but it was you know a reaction time task that then goes through, gets some computed into some sort of D score, and that was that was how we measured it. Yeah, thank you. It's interesting. So even if I associate um, like things that represent environmentalism with myself or something good. So I implicitly consider them good. That doesn't really affect my behavior. I think in this case, it's that they both are associated with behavior, but you can capture all the critical variants you need just by measuring the explicit. There's not a lot, if you have the explicit, adding the implicit doesn't add very much. And then because the explicit is so much easier to measure, yeah, forget it, don't use the implicit one. A little okay. bit sad because I was hoping to discover something cool, but also good news for all of us who measure it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's mm. really interesting, an interesting research. Oh, great. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, may, may I start? Thank you, Cameron, for your uh talk it was really great for me and uh, i gained a lot of questions uh, that i i will check in your papers because i just don't want to waste your time but one of the questions uh i i really like the experiment and uh, i was curious that you um, you told that environmentalism uh predicts how people choose uh, what people choose car or bike but uh, did you try to measure the environmentalism after this task because in my mind if it, if we're trying to be consistent and if we already uh, ask uh, were asked the question about uh, how environmentalist uh, how environmentally am i i would prefer to choose a bike just because i already reported that i am environmentally friendly. No, so, it's a very it's a very good question. I think you could have order effects either way. Like you could have it that you ask them yeah, that first and then yeah. they act consistent or yeah. you have them do the task they they realize, you know, I didn't I don't know, I didn't choose it that often and then they respond differently. In this case because the test was the critical focus, we must have asked the identity stuff afterwards like um, mm -hmm. uh, so that it didn't contaminate, but then it could be partially driven by their actual behavior. I guess that mm -hmm. would also depend on the base rate of what you made them do. Like um, in this case, everyone selects the bike sometimes if only to just see what happens, um, but then they end up doing it. Yeah, I don't know, 20 to 70% of the time. It's very rare that you get someone chooses the bike every time, it makes the study quite long. Um, but one of the benefits of this task is that you can really distinguish between people that uh, are merely excited about environmentalism, you know, that would all be fives on the on the Reb scale, but then people who really are willing to put 20 more minutes into it, which is painful. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. And uh, uh, also another good place, you feel free to contact me by email. That's why I put my email up. I'm happy to answer questions. And uh, Twitter is another really good place to connect with environmental psychologists and feel free to tweet at me. I will be happy to respond. Thank you. Yeah, your Twitter posts are, I think, really useful, yeah. So I was, I was just thinking about that yet. You know, you share your ideas in a very, you know, I think it's really good for uh, for us, for colleagues, definitely, but also for young researchers, especially because you do share a lot of insights that are quite useful, you know, to sort mm. of 
And uh, what you were telling now about um, registered reports, well, we were thinking about this, not necessarily in terms of reviews, although the idea of reviewing, yeah, getting a more constructive review just because you don't have uh, basically a journal reviewer acting as a gatekeeper could be an excellent. So with the complicated papers, that's probably where we should, you know, start with uh, when it's a straightforward one shouldn't cause <laughs> many problems but uh, for some of the papers yeah that could be really really useful and just generally yeah. Sasha had this experience in um, because she was studying in um, in Tilburg for a year as an exchange student so and that's where they used it and yeah we discussed about this so possibly yeah that makes sense Tilburg is a really uh, a center for methods reform they're doing really well yeah yeah um, well, I had a question about um, cultural culture, basically. So when we observe this effect green to be seen, yeah, do you have you have you had any? Um, well, I don't know if you have done. I, I didn't really realize whether there, any, there were any cross cultural studies that you have conducted yet. Um, but maybe you have observed from others investigating kind of closer close phenomena. Uh, to that, uh, where any cultural differences could act, especially probably in terms of how environmentally aware these cultures are, whether yeah. that would work. What, what do you think? Yeah. Uh, Boy, yeah. Um, it's a nice, it's a nice question. I don't have data on that. I, based on Kim and Eom's work that I presented, I guess my first guess would be the more individualistic countries like the US and the UK are going to be more likely to show these effects in public, like to random others as a kind of reputation management. So I think the, yeah, well, I mean, maybe an area that would be really cool to look at would be something like a behavioral spillover in the household about the other family members that you, you know, that are around you. I, I haven't done that kind of work, but um, I'm really interested in this question of signaling to whom. I'm just finding it really difficult to manipulate it or uh, find a good way to study it in situ. Uh, but no, I, I don't really have that data, but it really would be great to look at. Yeah, and that, um, you know, in that connection, social psychology could probably, uh, you know, all these studies of the reference group could be uh, probably useful. Exactly. Uh -huh. Exactly. And, and that's particularly um, important to realize when we look at something like the absolute level of how much people consider themselves to be an environmentalist. I'm a five out of seven or whatever. And then someone in Australia is a three out of seven. But what's, what are they comparing that to? Are we thinking of the same environmentalists? Because I never tell the participants what that word means. And so uh, there's going to be massive reference group effects here. And I don't pay much attention to the absolute level. I'm just looking at the relative level within a population. But then there's there's more um, wealth to be uh, mined there. Yeah. Yeah, well, I don't know when we will be able to do this, but um, it would be interesting, I think, for us to see this in Russia. The situation is in Russia is uh, such that, you know, we kind of, we were a collectivist, supposed to be a collectivist country, although I think that was partly imposed from the outside. So whether that was an identity thing or an imposed identity, I don't really know. Um, and there is some evidence suggesting that we're probably becoming a more individualistic society on the one hand. On the other, um, environmental behaviors and environmental culture in general is not uh, so popular yet. It is becoming a norm among the young generations. And it's probably something more intrinsic than, you know, an, 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 an identity thing. I think we're also looking at, you know, because um, it's something definitely to show off. I can see it by the reactions of, you know, some of the students sometimes, yeah. A nice shopping bag with a green label or, you know, going to buy clothes that are environmentally friendly and so it's all appealing to them. But at the same time, I feel that there is something coming more from, from the intrinsic value side that, you know, we're really in trouble 
and we need to solve it. Kind of, you know, also connecting with what uh, Fridays for Future did um, in yeah. the rest of the world. Here yeah. it's not, here it's not uh, unfortunately, really, really unfortunately, uh, something that can take root because of the just general, you know, we are, we're forbidden to protest all together <laughs> right now. <laughs> Everyone is really nervous. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, we're even wondering, yeah, it's also coming back to your first question, you know, whether a scientist is allowed to take a political position. Yeah, no, I, I thought about the audience when I was saying that, and, and Putin is joining Biden at this big uh, climate conference at a time when protesting is quite dangerous in Russia. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, but at the same time, Russia has been, you know, there, there, there have been some really positive steps. So Putin has said some important papers, you know, towards uh, cutting the emissions, I guess, because, yeah. of, you know, they, they took a lot of time to analyze how this is going to move, whether the divestments from fossil fuels are really going to happen, and they are happening. So there are many, you know, too many factors to, to summarize here, and it's not really probably our area. But I think they did take a lot of time to analyze and they are they are starting to take steps, at least, uh, you know, hearing from the president that he wants annual report from the inside, not for the international politics, but for the internal politics in terms of cutting the emissions. Uh, that is, I think, hopefully a sure sign that something is going to happen. And obviously, you know, being in trouble in terms of climate change, that, you know, a big part of our country is already, you know, like Canada also, yeah, it's kind yeah. of same latitudes affected by by climate change and economically we're kind of similar yeah in that connection with the uh, Canada yeah. and with the US especially being dependent our economy is you know hugely invested in uh, in fossil fuels so indeed yeah, we'll see yeah hopefully you know um, I'm not too hopeful but I'm more hopeful than I, than I used to be. I mean, I have, yeah, four years under the Trump administration. It's, it was hard for me to be hopeful about the U.S. also. But I think of this like, can we bend the needle? You know, it's, even when it's pointed in the wrong direction, can we bend it slightly? So that's the purpose of the work. Yeah. And I see there's a, a question here yeah. by Victoria um, about the campaign in Vietnam. And unfortunately, I don't know the answer to that. So this wasn't, a, this wasn't an experiment. It wasn't a study and they didn't interview anyone afterwards. They just looked at the levels of, um, of consumption over time and they did decrease, but they don't know if it decreased because of this campaign. It could have been an era effect. It could have been about availability. So really, I, I'm not sure. We'd have to look into that, um, but thanks for asking. Oh, uh, yes, thank you for your answer. Well, I was quite curious because I think one of the uh, main conception of the RIN, it's uh, not about the status or brand, it's more about, I think, uh, like for medical reasons. So people use it for, I don't know, for the hangovers or something similar. I'm not too sure, but I think that I was quite curious if it's as a long term effect because it will be interesting. Yeah, there's, there are, there are several reasons that people use it, but it's so expensive that uh, it, it is often a very wrapped up in status, even if it's um, said to be health related. Yeah. Thank you for that. So, um, Irina, did you have a question? Yeah, Irina, please, yeah. Irina is uh, one of the long, long term career environmental psychologists in Russia. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. So, uh, first of all, I'm, I'll say for a long time, for 20 years, I'm dealing with interdisciplinarity. Uh, so, not um, doing research in psychology, uh, especially, but in this field of sustainable development more. And uh, yesterday, it seems to me two days ago, uh, results of the survey were published by Forbes Journal uh, about uh, concern of uh, Russian citizens uh, on the SDGs, yes, Sustainable Development Goals. And what's interesting in this report that uh, people in Russia and in different regions are more concerned about reducing poverty about uh, food uh, and um, having better food, we can say, about quality of education, about health, and about the stability of economic growth. And mm -hmm. they are less concerned about climate change mm -hmm. and other issues. So they, they really showed very low level. <laughs> and that, that is, that is that interesting. That's really an interesting result. That's really yes. interesting. And so it is, of course, it gives us reflection of the reality and of the real situation, for example, in the regions, 
Yes. And uh, also the data shows that uh, Northwest, St. Petersburg, Moscow, for example, and some cities in um, central regions are more concerned than uh, all the rest. And hmm. that, that's, that's also very interesting. It, seems. it is. That is very make interesting. This kind of understanding of how psychological uh, issues are correlated with this um, real situation, with the policies, with the politics, and so on. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I've, I've been getting increasingly involved with SDGs, but at a very outside level and really quite disciplinary. But um, I'm glad you mentioned that. And I know that Russia is actually extremely heterogeneous, you know, in terms of uh, languages and regions and ethnic groups and economics and, and all the rest of it. So I would expect some differences. The last comment about those, those kinds of measures never made that much sense to me. I think they are important, but I mean to say when people say that economy is more important than environment, like it completely ignores that they're so deeply connected to each other. And someone could, could uh, those sort of ranking scales kind of almost bake in the assumption that they're separate, which I always found kind of weird. Um, but it, it, it's useful for us to know that when people are ordering their priorities, yeah, environment can be quite low, and that's been true in the in the West as well. Thank you. Thank you. I, I personally think this may be an effect of the pandemic as well, uh, which drew attention on obviously economically yeah, we've all suffered, possibly. Um, also because um, you know some of the earlier surveys, just you know earlier something as a year or or two maximum earlier like Tsiom and others, yeah, big, big surveys were showing that actually the environmental issues, not climate change per se, but they were mostly like asking about environmental issues, were occupying second position. I don't remember what was the first, but you know, uh, it's it's been looking to me at least that they were coming up in priorities as, uh, you know, um, yeah, as the years go by, but maybe the pandemic did affect, and I don't know which survey that is in particular, so. No, it's hard to say really. Yes, of course, Lena. And also, I remember these uh, results of the survey. It seems to me it was Gallup in 1992. And they used two different options. One option was when they were asking, what are you concerned about? What is your concern? What are you concerned more? And then, for example, environmental issues were not on the uh, high first level, of course. But when the, um, people were given the special uh, issues, special subjects, are you concerned about, for example, pollution? Are you concerned about this? And so then they answered yes to no, the results were different. And it's also a very interesting psychological effect. What is, how to say, the high priority in your consciousness? Yes, or what, what do you really understand that thing? Yes, and I what you mentioned about this uh, political situation that we announced, uh, so uh, as it was the, it seems to me, on the eve of the new year in 2016, when it was uh, the uh, special order of the president that uh, started this uh, interest in, uh, as they call it, uh, ecological sustainable development of the country. And there were some uh, orders produced in this case we really see now a lot of activities, activities coming because we all know that in Russia, the uh, how to say mechanism of activity is when you have something from top down, then you will have the reaction. And we really have this activity now from the uh, state statistics, we have the activity from business, we have the activities from some ministers. And so they want to show that they follow this. And that's interesting. Situation. Well, for, for top-down systems, that can be, yeah. they can move very quickly. They can be quite agile. Yeah. So uh, when it's driven by the executive, you can have a lot of uh, change very quickly that is consistent across different levels of government. So that, that can be great. That can be great, <laughs> yes. Okay. Let's hope. Yeah. yeah, I personally think that business is going to play a huge role right now, divesting from and just showing the direction if we get more smart people in business realizing what is happening, and that's where the money is anyway, nowadays. 
it's yeah. hopefully it, it could provide a, a major solution for all of us because governments are really slow to react you know we've been yeah. working evaluating policies and you can see and how dependent it is also on your you know particular governments like in the uk uh you could see the um, uh, a loss of complete loss of interest in the topic of obesity you know changing from um left government to to the to the right is sort of so the same could happen to the environmental area, definitely. And uh, politics are not totally reliable and too slow to develop. And um, I agree with that. And there's been a there's been a sort of a history within environmental psychology of ignoring business or thinking business is gross or something. Yeah, completely wrongheaded. We should be going towards them and engaging with all all actors. Yeah, I do think so. Yeah, it's not easy, probably, but it's less no. easy for us than dealing with uh, with the governments and you know working for you know ministries and so. <laughs> but nevertheless, um, yeah, um, I think Sasha wanted to say something, and I also have a question. You know, I would like to discuss the impact versus. Uh, oh, okay, sure. Yeah, let's like, go to let's go to yeah. Sasha first. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, colleagues. I wanted to raise a discussion about social signaling because when I studied, um, I, I had an idea that social signaling is an evolutionary sign of power and the sign of social dominance somehow. So if we are looking to the social signaling, do you, do you refer it to somehow uh, social dominance or not in your, in your studies? And if people signal it uh, from that side, it's more likely that um, it's, it's been more important for them to be uh, powerful than to be environmentalist. That, that's why they're doing this. And the second question about social signaling, as I know the study that says, if we have a, a social signaling of our richness to the people, who are our friends, it works, uh, it works bad that they will not willing to, to do the same actions. They will have envy towards you and so on. So they are not willing to uh, make the same actions. But if you have a social signaling like money of your richness for your work colleagues it will work well they will try to to have the same actions and how do you think this social signaling works uh in the field of environment for those kind of groups for those kind of difference if we show our power oh it's really interesting stuff yeah let me handle the second question first because i really don't know uh, but uh, that's a very stimulating idea. I think it has to do with matching, broadly speaking, matching the, the goals and values of the people who are observing to what the process is that you're engaging with. And there's a, there's a kind of a hidden assumption in a lot of environmentalism that we just need to convince people to care more about mother nature. We just need to tell them about what's happening in the, in the atmosphere, and then they will naturally develop the same values we have. I think that's generally misguided and it makes more sense to identify what are their goals in this setting, like you said about you know, colleagues trying to earn money or whatever. Uh, what are their goals and how does what you're desiring them to do fit with their existing goals, uh, like the WWF um, campaign. So broadly speaking on that second point, I agree and I don't know and it's very interesting about whether power is the sort of theoretical home of signaling. It wasn't for me, but I think that that's another angle one could take. I have been thinking about it more in terms of reputation and social inclusion. Like we all have a network of relationships that help us feel more or less safe and more or less belonging in our in our groups and in our different contexts. Like for example, I feel more belonging in the department now that I'm an assistant professor than back when I was a student or a postdoc. And that's like just a kind of a buy-in from the institution. There's more engagement with me, but maybe I would feel that, you know, and those are the sorts of things that it wasn't primarily for me about power. It was more about um, like, um, whether how people think about what groups they belong to 
and how others are reacting to them. But I do agree that power is also an undergoing, uh, ongoing topic in that, and one could use that angle. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much for your uh, answer because uh, in my mind, it was always related to the power because I studied from the evolutionary point of view sure, and sure. from the economic psychology. And that's why I was, I was curious how it works for you in your study because I didn't uh, connect it to, to that. I, I haven't seen, much. yeah, I haven't seen those explicitly connected. I think that would be a useful piece to write. So um, look forward to seeing something about that someday. But uh, <laughs> I think environmentalists are often a bit hippie leftist and would avoid that kind of topic, which means that it's even more valuable for someone to write about how environmental behaviors are, uh, are uh, one facet of dominance. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um... Does anyone have anyone who hasn't asked questions yet? Maybe has a question for Cameron. Okay. Okay. Maybe you're still, got, still gathering ideas. That's fine. Please do ask uh, later. Then um, I would like just to come back to the discussion on uh, impact versus whatever we call it. Yeah, motivation, environmental motivation environmental identity. Um, so environmentally motivated intrinsically, yeah, uh, motivated uh, reasons for behaviors. Well, um, we we did have to, we, we had this discussion and, uh, you know, we were wondering because in Russia, I think um, uh, the majority of what is considered to be pro-environmental behaviors uh, in environmental psychology would not be identified by people necessarily as pro-environmental. So the most obvious would be something dealing with environmental pollution. So those those behaviors they they would be connected. But if we take you know energy use behaviors where we have as a society less education. So anything that would be related to climate uh, would not be necessarily considered by, especially, yeah, by the majorities of uh, categories as, um, as pro-environmental. So if we were, because uh, one of the aims of our group is to create actually a Russian scale of pro-environmental behaviors, something that is really adapted to the context of the country, you know, why not? Because uh, it's, a, it's, it's, a big, uh, it's a big country, you know, it's very diverse. Uh, also, you know, the, just speaking of the whole country, actually, that uh, does uh, provoke some, you know, worry in terms of how this is going to be used throughout the country. Can we really measure pro environmental behavior throughout country? Because just as Irina was saying, we have big differences in terms of regions. And uh, Moscow and St. Petersburg are the most, edu probably some of the most educated regions, you know, that sort of pockets of education and culture we have other you know big cities obviously but also it's the economy and it's uh, yeah that's where you know politics probably um, uh, policies uh, concentrate also mostly but anyhow uh, that's going to be hard to do and we we had a lot of discussion should we measure something that is really pro-environmental because you know we have other types of behavior here that relate mostly to greening you know planting green basically trees whatever uh clearing um, territories from litter and things like that uh protecting so preserving wildlife so these are you know common individual behaviors uh, but then we had a discussion with uh, Lorraine Whitmarsh and um, um, well, she, she did point out to, to this discussion and definitely, you know, we went for the impact oriented scale at the end. So it doesn't really matter probably. Uh, I think my connection may not be great. Oh, it's yeah, okay, I can probably I can hear you. The screen. Yeah, the screen has frozen. Um, yeah, so um, we went for, for well, we are, we are now, we have something as about 100 items that we are testing in the first instance, uh, looking, you know, how this is going to work. Uh, by the way, you know, Sasha or Fatiha, you, you're welcome to pitch in a question about that as well. Uh, we have uh, some over-representation of answers, so some, some of the, you know, 
um, something like, you know, do you participate in clearing, uh, for instance, has a huge overrepresentation of answers towards uh, always, uh, you know, and uh, very often, something like that. Yeah. Mm, someone, you know, some other items get less attention and so on. So what we have now in front of us is this task of, uh, in front of us is the task of, you know, choosing which items we're going to, to get, you know, some of the most obvious ones, because we also think that we will include some items for the future, maybe as a block, maybe as something that will be integral part of the scale and that will be more relevant in sort of five years time. You know, anything that is about renewables, anything that uh, probably some of the questions that relate to climate change as well, and uh, so on and so forth. So yeah, for us, the question is to probably to measure impact. That's what we need to understand. Yeah, what, what, what we, you know, uh, what we basically, um, mm, how we behave. Um, as a as a nation so if we get some representative data which we hope to this year as well also looking into determinants but then we have this issue as you pointed uh towards yeah that uh, all this um uh environmental psychology theory to explain behaviors some of it may not work some of some of them and we, we do find some you know some good correlates and some you know um well correlates yeah because we look into cross-sectional studies um, but yeah, we do have this question of that some of these variables will be poorly explaining the behavior and we need yeah. to look into something else and maybe as some studies should be actually future studies should be oriented instead of looking at the determinants, they should be investigating something else. Uh, moving on, so why, how, how do we use this knowledge on impact of behaviors and uh, you yeah. know, the frequency of uh, impactful behaviors and move on from the study of determinants towards something else possibly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Oof. Yeah, it's a really tricky um, tightrope to be walking. I also came into the similar challenges when I was developing the REB scale. I think that the way to clarify the approach is to try and imagine whether some items would fit in the scale that are really, really impact items. Like, for example, how many square meters per person is in your living space? Like, is that a psychology variable? But it is going to be relevant for, you know, their actual impact. And if you say that's not really the kind of item that we had in mind, then that, 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 you know, that gets you towards this. And the work that I've been doing suggests that if you measure just impact, like, you know, what, gallons of water used or uh, tons of CO2 emitted, whatever, the variables that predict those are not the same ones. Uh, and they're more like income, for example, income predicts impact even for leftist, environmentalist, urban people who are well-educated. So like, it kind of depends which theories and um, linkages you want to connect to later, I think. Because if you want to stay firmly within the kind of environmental psychology literature as it is now, it's, it's more difficult if you stray away from all the you know, theory of planned behavior, value, belief, norm kind of approaches, which won't correlate quite as well with actual impact. At the same time, we, and we've argued in this recent piece, why are we doing all this stuff if it's not actual impact? So uh, I, I feel conflicted about this. I think it. I think in the, in the long term, our field needs to move towards measuring impact more like broadly where we recognize, okay, maybe this particular thing, psychology is not very important for it. And then when you're looking at a broader perspective, like the sustainability development goals, you can say, okay, for these behaviors, for this outcome, for that impact, this is where psychology should be engaging with other disciplines. Here's where we need to partner with the engineers and the economists to do this and that the other thing and here's on and on this behavior we really don't need to that's more of a structural change that needs to happen and that's my vision of what the field could use in terms of a particular research group i just would be cautious going hardcore towards impact 
you know, you're going to end up having items like how many kids do you have? And people don't want to think about that as a pro environmental behavior. And so there's some, there's some sort of disciplinary danger here, I would say, but um, it sounds like the approach you're taking is, is pretty good and probably in line with what I would have been doing in your case. Um, yeah, yeah, no, definitely. We are not, we're not getting, you know, into, into very sharp questions like this. We do include questions of, for instance, flying and meat eating. We're not talking about children. And I think one of the reasons is because when we were um, composing the, um, the list of, uh, of the behaviors, we have, uh, we had interviews with uh, experts in Russia with uh, the population and we were analyzing literature and that question of uh, population rise is not really reflected in the local rhetorics so <laughs> I guess nobody really mentioned that in uh, in what we had so we didn't include that but when we talk about impact um, yeah I think I think it includes both um, we just didn't want to to exclude because it's not only in Russia I think uh, definitely I remember you know through interviews and uh, just different data that we had in the UK that people also didn't necessarily consider saving energy as a, as an environmental behavior so we're not alone in that uh, boat and uh, yeah there are other nations basically one one, uh, one small detail about that is that uh, when i've done a factor structure analysis on the rev scale it has a much tighter one dimensional factor among environmentalists and yeah. then that makes sense because for them, all the behaviors are related to each other. But for someone who doesn't have the education or who's not interested, uh, then then driving and uh, buying, you know, I don't know, bamboo pants or whatever. Yeah, they're totally unrelated. Yeah, definitely, definitely. But it's uh, yeah, as you pointed out, a lot of it will be I think a lot of it will be will be explained by by the education. Uh, some of it will be explained by gender and by age. Yeah, by, by region in our case, I think. Yeah. Um, and I think, yeah, that discussion, that discussion of which determinants we should be investigating, you know, whether, because also what do we, what do we get? Because behavior in itself, you know, that's kind of question that I'm trying to discuss also with students that we talk about, you know, and that's, that's where um, uh, all this work on habits and social practices come, for example, just as an attempt, you know, there should be much more research in terms of what do we consider in environmental psychology as behavior and as, as pro-environmental behavior in this case, because we just uh, treat it as, uh, as an entity and we don't really go, you know, to sort of analyze what it's like, what are the different yeah, components of it, like social practices theory does, for example. Mm. And do definitely um, uh, lack that. And um, that's probably why we also don't really know uh, much what to do with, uh, with, the different, um, with the different data that we have uh, nowadays. Yeah, uh, maybe. Yeah, in terms of how to apply on because I think I think there is still a lot uh, a lot of it completely unapplied in policy and in practice you know it's I'm just you know kind of uh, thinking aloud <laughs> right yeah, yeah, now absolutely no but, it's, uh, uh, there's a lot of possibilities here yeah. yeah these things need to be we are in an open plan office so I call it just came oh, in a rare yeah. situation because you know we're kind of open right now uh, but uh, very few people come into work Sure, because, sure. Um, yeah, everything. I uh, share my office too. Yeah. yeah. So, um, any other questions from anyone? Well, feel free to feel free to send me an email. Anyone? It's been a pleasure to speak with your group, and uh, I look forward to seeing the work that you're coming up with. Yeah. Thank you very much. We may get in touch about our scale at some point, just to you know to maybe discuss something. And uh, sure. that was really useful. Thank you so much, Cameron. Excellent talk, and thank you for you know for the discussion. Um, I'm sure we'll meet again. <laughs> it, it was my pleasure. Very nice yeah. to meet you all, one and until days, next time. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, one of these days it would be really interesting to look into whether we can see how the green to be seen is working in Russia. 
So that's probably a plan for future, <laughs> hopefully. Well, speaking of the future, Russia is really on my travel list as well. So maybe we'll get a chance to meet someday. <laughs> yeah, when we, yeah, when we can travel <laughs> collectively. Yes, yeah. we will be very happy to see you here, definitely. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And, uh, talk Thank, you. Thank you very much for your nice talk. Nice to meet you all. Thank okay. You. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.